Okay, let's get settled in. I want to ask you the usual questions, which is, are you in a group or do you have a company? Actually, I did just now. I'll act like you already have a company. So from this point on, I'm going to assume that you have a company, even if that's not true, because that's kind of a prerequisite for the rest of the class. But I want to start off today very quickly doing the final pieces of the risk free rate. Remember we talked about it on Wednesday? And if you get a chance, do watch that webcast, because it takes you through the mechanics of how to go from a government bond rate in a currency to a risk free rate. And there are only two things I want to kind of emphasize about the discussion before we move on. The first is countries don't have risk free rates, currencies do. Okay? And that sounds like a distinction made out of nothing, but think of the EU. You have countries, right? You have Spain, you have Greece, but in 2000 or whenever they made that transition to the euro, there were no more currencies. So if you ask me what is the risk free rate for Greece, I might sound like I'm nitpicking, but I'm going to say there is no risk-free rate for Greece, at least at the moment. I can give you what a risk-free rate is in euros. Separate the two. And what that will allow you to do is when you look at your company, it is incorporated in a country, right? You don't have to use that country's currency in assessing that company. So uh, I think somebody here was asking where the Argentine risk-free rate was. Were you asking? First, like the Greek risk-free rate, Greek government bond rate being risk-free in Argentine, risk-free rate is almost an oxymoron right now, right? And the reason it's not there is what did I do to get these risk-free rates? I started with a government bond denominated in the local currency. That's the starting point. Without that, I'm kind of sunk. I extracted from it the default spread, and I came up with the risk-free rate. If I do not have a long-term government bond in the local currency, I'm sunk. I might be able to find an Argentine government bond in some other currency, but I cannot find a local bond rate. You say, what do I do with an Argentine company? If you picked an Argentine company, you just got lucky. Because remember, I said currency was a choice. You're going to be assessing your Argentine company in US dollars, and if you're willing to get over the the the, the the hurdles you have to if you're in Argentine, you can assess your Argentine company in Brazilian rias. I know it sounds it makes your stomach kind of crunch. No, I don't want to do that. But you can pick any currency you want to assess any company. Final point about risk free rates. You look at this graph, what do you see? Very different numbers, right? If I do my hurdle rate in Japanese yen, yeah, it's going to be much lower than if I do my hurdle rate in Nigerian Naira. Well, if I left it there, you're saying, then it's simple. I'll just stick with the lowest currency, the lowest risk-free rate currency, because then all my hurdle rates will be low. But remember, once you've extracted default risk out of these rates, what you're left with are risk-free rates. And of course, there are, I might have issues with how I did it. But if these are truly risk-free rates, there's only one thing that's separating them, one variable that leads to some rates being higher than, than others, and that's the expected inflation. So when I pick a low risk-free rate currency, it's true I'll get a lower hurdle rate, but the low inflation that caused the hurdle rate to be low will also be a low inflation in your cash flows. For the moment, you have to take it on trust, but I'll come back and back this up. If you do this right, you should get exactly the same value for a project or a company, no matter which currency you pick. And that's exceptionally good news, because it means pick a currency, do it right because you should get the same answer in every other currency. So assuming you've picked your company, pick a currency. Do it soon. Get the risk-free rate nailed down, because then we can talk about the rest of the process. Because I'm going to move to the second item. And before I do that, I want to deal with something a little disquiet I might have created with that 8% that I threw out there. Remember I said only 8% of the differences in returns are explained by differences in betas? Let me tell you a story. When I first came to NYU, I used to, no, or, and actually once we moved to this building in 260, just before I taught my class, Ed Deming, Edward Deming, who's, you know, was 92 years old, he actually was in, the, in his late 90s, and he'd fly out from LA and he'd teach a class. For those of you who've never heard of Deming, 
he is considered the, fa the father of the rebirth of Japanese industry because basically what he did after the Second World War was create the zero defect rule, which is he said we want to make sure that any chance of mistakes go, goes away. So his focus was total quality control, which is the exact opposite of where I'm coming from, right? Because I'm saying I'm taking 8%, I'm running with it, I'm okay with it. So let me explain why Deming would not be able to do hurdle rates for companies. Not because he's not smart, no, but he comes from a different mindset. I, I was in LA last week and I flew back and no, I took United Airlines. But let's assume that you come to the airport, you haven't bought a ticket yet, there are two airlines next to each other. There's, no, I won't name the airlines because I don't want to abuse them. So the first airline runs regular aircraft where they try to make sure there are zero defects. The second airline says, look, you know, we'll reduce the defects to 1%. That's a 99% okay rate, but one in 100 planes might not make it. <laughs> now you can say, well, the law of large numbers works in my favor. I'll go with it. So let's say they drop the fare by 50% on the second airline. I'll wager that none of us would get on the second airline, even though there's only a 1% chance of failure. You know why? Because that failure is going to be catastrophic, right? The law of large numbers doesn't work if you're a small number. And you're on a flight, and that flight crashes, you're done. You're saying, what's the difference in investing? What's happening if you screw up on a beta? You're going to be wrong on an individual investment, right? But if you have a portfolio of investments, you know what the R squared is going to look like? Betas do very badly in explaining individual company returns, but if you have a portfolio of 25 companies, Betas magically start to explain 60% of what's going on. You think, but there's still 40% that's not explained. Well, that 40% can cut both ways. Sometimes you're going to make more money than expected. Other times you're going to make less money than expected. And with a portfolio, there is no catastrophe with any individual mistake. That's why we're okay being wrong in corporate finance. The consequences of being wrong are not just small, they could be good. Right? You could actually make more money than expected. That's why finessing this and trying to get to 100% doesn't work or is not necessary if you think about building up hurdle rates to come up with expected returns. So now let me get back to where I am. I've got a risk-free rate. Let's talk about equity risk premiums. Let me give you the, what I'm trying to estimate, and then we'll look at how we can get there and what will drive it. The equity risk premium is what you, so think about yourself, don't even think about the rest of the world, what you would demand over and above the risk-free rate for investing in equities as a class. So let me repeat that again. It's what you would demand over and above the risk-free rate for investing in equities as a class. So if right now, let's say we're working in US dollars. The risk-free rate is roughly 2%, right? The question I'm asking is how much more than 2% would I need to offer you for you to invest in equities as a class? And already you can see the number that's swirling in your head is a function of two things. One is what do you think about the risk of equities overall, right? What do you think of an average risk stock? Is it GE or is it Google? Because that will drive the premium. The second is it's going to depend on how risk averse you are as an individual. So let's, let's narrow in on that and think about what is it that drives that risk aversion. These studies of risk aversion have been on for like 200 years. People have been running experiments. So I'm going to throw some very broad classes of people at you, and I'd like you to tell me which group is going to be more risk averse. Let's start easy. Young people versus old people. Who's more risk averse? Older people tend to be more risk averse. And that's actually an interesting follow-up. If a population ages then, what's going to happen to the equity risk premium in that country? It's going to go up. If you look across the world, the parts of the world that are aging the fastest are Europe and Japan. And if nothing else, the aging of the population will mean people will demand a higher risk premium, which means stocks are going to be priced lower in those countries, assuming you stay within those markets. So the first is age. That was easy. Now comes a touchier issue. Men and women. Who's more risk averse? <laughs> was that a man who said that? Right. Actually, the, the research is very interesting. Young women are more risk averse than young men. 
A fact I can attest to because I have three boys and a girl. And the only one whose car I will get into when she drives is my daughter. My son's no way. I'd rather run 15 months. Okay? But as you age, risk aversion catches up. So by the time you get to 40 or 45, you're roughly about the same risk aversion with one small caveat. Men still remain less risk averse with small bets than men, women do. So you might bet $20 in a football game. You say, I don't even think about it. Women go through probabilities, actuarial tables. That doesn't look good. Let me kind of get back to you, maybe tomorrow. No. But young men tend to be more, less risk averse than young women. And here's one of the great problems you have in trading rooms. Any of you traded before you came back to school? Okay. You walk into a trading room, and you look around the room. Most trading rooms, what's the subset of the human race that you see in there? 25 to 30-year-old males, right? The most dangerous group on the face of the earth to allow to take risk. In fact, right after one of these, every, every six months you get another scandal, right? Somebody loses three billion. I suggest only half in jest that if banks really wanted to cut down on trading scandals, all they had to do was something very simple. Hire every trader's mother. <laughs> this is critical. Pay them 150,000 or something. It's, it's penny change. Make them sit in the chair behind the trader. <laughs> Because mothers are natural risk breaks, right? What are you doing? You can't do that. You've got to think about it, right? I know it sounds like an expense, but you will save yourself billions of dollars over time with mothers overseeing traders. Maybe that's an app we should come up with, the mother app, right? Every time before a trade, the mother app speaks up. Are you sure you want to do that? Remember what? I mean, even without knowing it, remember what happened when you were younger, when you tried that? You know, maybe you shouldn't. Eh? So women tend to be more risk averse when they're younger, but they catch up. Do you think you as a group are more a risk averse than the group that went through in 2007? More, you're more risk averse because you saw what a crisis looked like. Eh? The 2009 group was very, they came in here, they said, risk, oh my god, I don't even want to touch that. So risk aversion changes over time. So already what I'm, say, what I'm laying the foundations for is this can't be a fixed number that doesn't change over time. It's got to vary across markets. It's got to vary across time. It's got to vary across different types of equities. And that's the challenge we face is how do you come up with that number? So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to do a survey. Think of this as the entire market. We're going to nail the equity risk premium down right now. And here's what I want you to do. Let's assume it's five years out. Why does it have to be five years out? I have to assume that you have savings, which is kind of tough to do when you're going to school. Everything's being sucked up by Stern, right, every six months. So let's say it's five years out. You've now accumulated some savings. And all of your money is invested risklessly, earning 3%. I've quit my job. I've become a salesperson for the Vanguard 500 index fund. So you're very specific about the equities I'm selling, right? The 500 largest market cap stocks. I call you during dinner. Why? Because that's when I get you. So what's this I hear about all your money being invested risklessly? Would you be interested in taking all of your money? So listen carefully, because this is the choice you're going to face. Taking all of your money from where it is now, earning 3% guaranteed, and switching it to the Vanguard 500 index fund. Well, to induce you to do that, I've got to offer you an expected return, right? So I want you to think of that number in your head. There is no right answer. So don't look at your neighbor, because this is about you. And the question I have is, what is that expected return I would have to offer you on the S&P 500 to make the switch? You're making 3% guaranteed right now. I said there was no wrong answer. There's one potentially very wrong answer. <laughs> <laughs> I've told you up front just to protect you. Hey? Everything else is fair game. So I'm going to go down these choices. And if this is the choice you would make, put up your hand. OK? You ready? 3% guaranteed, the expected return on the, S on the S P 500. Less than 3%. Anybody? This, of course, 
is the one really wrong answer. If all of you had put up your hands, you know what I'd have said? I said, you know what, this is beyond redemption. This class is a waste of time. Might as well just let go right now, right? You see why? If you're getting 3% guaranteed, you'd be crazy to settle for less than 3% on a risky asset, right? So let's cross that off the list. Every other choice is fair game, right? Between 3 and 5%. Anybody? So that's an equity risk premium between 0 and 2%. Nobody. Okay. 5 to 7. Are these the most risk averse people in the room or the least risk averse people in the room? They're the least risk averse people in the room. They'll be into equities faster. They'll have more of their money in risky assets. Nothing good or bad about it. It's the nature of the game. So their risk premium is between two and four. Seven to nine percent. It's like the middle of the distribution. Nine to eleven. And more than eleven percent. I haven't done this, but actually. I'd wager if I went around the room, there'd be a significantly large percentage of emerging market people in this group. We are a product of our experiences as well. I told you that your age affects your equity risk premium, your sex affects your equity risk premium, your experiences affect your equity risk premium, and I forgot to mention this. Some of your equity risk premium you were born with. I'll keep talking about my four kids because they're the ones I know best. I can tell you which one of my kids is going to be invested in bonds for the rest of his life, and which one is going to be the option trader. My 25-year-old still walks down the stairs holding on to the banister. It's a fixed income guy. I might fall now. I might fall now. How about right now, right? <laughs> He's always been that way. My, two, my youngest, when he was two, took off from the top stair expecting to be caught before he hit the bottom. There's an option trader. Well, something good's going to happen down there. Eh? <laughs> so some of this you were born with, so don't fight it. In fact, you know how they have these, uh, you know, before you get married, they, have, they, they make you talk to a counselor to make sure you are. I think you need to take a risk aversion test to make sure you're on the same page, because one of the most dangerous things to do is marry somebody who's at the other end of the risk spectrum. Because the rest of your life, you're going to be fighting it out over your portfolio. So in fact, if this were the entire market, I'd be done. You know what the equity risk premium would be? It would be a weighted average of the numbers each of you gave me. Because each of you gave me your equity risk premium and you gave me the number. You, so if you said, I want 11%, basically your equity risk premium is 8%, right? You think weighted by what? Not by how much, enth how much enthusiasm you showed when you put up your hand, but by how much money you have. Let me be brutally honest with you. If you have no money, I don't care what your equity risk premium is. You can whisper it to me, you can yell it at me, I don't care. You have $40 billion, I'm all yours. So what Warren Buffett thinks about the equity risk premium right now matters more than what everybody in this building, the next 10 buildings, and perhaps the entire neighborhood. This is not a democracy. It's a dollar-weighted democracy, and if this were the market, the weights you would put to those would be the amount of money you bring to the market, and the equity risk premium I would come up with would be the equity risk premium for the entire market. Now do you see why this is going to be almost impractical to do? Because this isn't the entire market. The entire market is 55, 60 million people in it, and what would I need to know? I'd need to know from each person what their equity risk premium is and how much money they have. This would be like a Nigerian email gone crazy, right? I send an email out to the entire world, say, send me your equity risk premium and how much money you have. Let's assume I do get a 100% response. I take a weighted average. I'm done, right? For the moment. And let me explain why I said for the moment. The market opened at 9.30 this morning, right? At a record high. This is a pure hypothetical, so don't freak out. Nothing's happened to your job, your portfolios. But let's say while you were sitting here, the market went into a total meltdown. It's down 25%. Remember the question I asked you a few minutes ago? How much more than 3% would I need to offer you to invest in stocks? Let's assume I'd ask, I asked you the same question now. Just I threw this one small piece of information. Market's down 25%. How many of you would now demand a larger premium than you did just five minutes ago? And why? What, what would make you demand a larger premium? 
what happened? Oh, all I said was I threw in this fact, I mean, but the 25% drop has already happened, but you can already see how risk is mental, partly, because you're saying, oh my God, now this is risk. Sometimes you need a big market correction to remind you of risk. This is why in long bull markets, people forget. They can talk in abstractions about risk, but risk is actually not just a number. It's that feeling in the pit of your stomach. While you sit there watching the terminal and you're seeing your entire investment portfolio melt down five minutes every, or 5% every minute, that's until you felt that you really haven't felt risk, so you're getting a reminder of risk. Let me ask you a different question. How many of you demand a smaller premium now than you did before? There's actually a rationale for it, and your argument would be? In other words, if stocks were great at 18,000, they should be even better at 14. This is the classic contrarian investment strategy, right? And I'll, I'll, I'll concede that to you, but I'll also tell you that, that is, it is one of the most difficult strategies to put into practice. Try it. Try buying something in the middle of a meltdown. Your hand will not move. I have to get the buy button. I can't get there. My hand's frozen. Because psychologically, you feel the urge to panic. But you can see that risk premiums move. So whether they go up or down, they're changing. Which effectively means that even if I can survey people and find out what their equity risk premium is, I have to keep doing it almost every minute of every day to get an updated number. So what I'd like to talk about are three different ways in which you can estimate the equity risk premium. The first is a way that almost no one uses, but I'll go through it anyway because it's an extension of what we just did, which is to survey investors and ask them what kind of equity risk premium would you need. The second is to look backwards. You know what I mean by backwards? What's the question I'm asking you? How much would you demand for investing in stocks over something riskless, right? What if I could tell you what people have made in the last 20, 30, 50, 60 years investing in stocks? That's called a historical premium. And the third approach is what I'm going to call an implied premium, which is a forward-looking premium. So I'm going to survey investors. I'm going to look at the past. I'm going to look at the future. Let's see why we get different numbers and which one to go with if you do get different numbers. So let's start with the surveys. Clearly, you cannot survey every single equity investor. So almost every one of these surveys out there does a subset. So I'm going to list a few of them. The Securities Industries Association, which is a trade group, used to survey individual investors, and the last year that they did the survey was 2004, and they stopped. And they stopped because they discovered it was completely and totally pointless. And here's why. What they were getting is they were asking individual investors, what do you think stocks will do over the next year? And here's what individual, individual investors were giving them. Hopes, not expectations. You know what I mean by hopes? I hope stocks are up 20%, so I'm going to say 20%. Anybody can say anything, so they stopped. They said, this is useless. Merrill Lynch every month does a survey of institutional investors, global portfolio managers, and they ask them this simple question, what do you think stocks will do over the next year? They report on a monthly basis. Their premium at the end of 2013, and I'm trying to get the update for 2000 and up to 2015, was about 4.8%. So that's what portfolio managers were saying they needed over and above the risk free rate. Campbell Harvey and, 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 uh, and Professor Graham, who teach at Duke, do a survey of CFOs once a year. See how this is a different audience? Portfolio managers are looking at this from the investor side. CFOs are using it to come up with hurdle rates in companies. And CFOs in 2012, which is the last year they did this update, were demanding a premium of 4.5%. So file all of these away. I'm not saying any of these are right, but no, that's what the numbers look like. Pablo Fernandez, who teaches in Spain, did a survey of analysts. And he came up with an average across equity research analysts that they were using 5% premiums. And perhaps the most useless survey of all, Pablo also surveys academics. <laughs> useless, because what did I say the, pre this, the premium has to be weighted by? How much money you have. Yeah? So let's get it out of the way. But, so I guess we have a disproportionate influence, even though we don't have the money. And they came back with 5.7%. But here's the bottom line. No one uses these survey premiums. Even Merrill, which does this survey every month, doesn't use it internally as their equity risk premium to come up with a hurdle rate. Why? Because it tends to be a reflection of what's already happened than what's expected to happen. In other words, you ask investors after a really good year in stocks, what do you think stocks will do? They come back with a really high number. 
You ask them after a really bad year, they come back with a really low number. They reflect the past rather than forecast the future. So the only sector where survey premiums used to have a place, but even there it's getting shaky, was real estate. Cushman and Wakefield, which is this uh, real estate outfit in New York, used to do surveys of real estate developers around the country, and it used to release this four-page brochure by state and by type of property of what developers were demanding as a rate of return. So as an example, if you are interested in residential property in Florida, you could go to the survey, Florida residential property, 9%. That's what real estate developers were demanding as a rate of return for investing in residential property in Florida. You'd use that as your cost of equity. And it worked because there were relatively few players in the game. There were developers, and they all thought alike. You know what's caused that system to break down? In the last 20 years, what's happened to real estate? A lot more securitization, REITs, MLPs, which come from a very different place. So even in that sector, people have stopped using survey premiums. So I just wanted to cover it to make sure that you saw it, but you're not going to see this anymore because no one uses survey premiums anymore. Let's talk about historical premiums. I told you no one uses survey premiums. Well, almost everyone uses historical premiums. Sounds fancy, but here's what you do. You take a slice of history. 20 years, 40 years, 50 years, you ask two questions. What would I have made on average investing in stocks over this period? What would I have made on average investing in T-bonds or T-bills over this period? So let's put some numbers in. Let's assume you'd have made 8% investing in stocks and 5% investing in T-bonds. 8 minus 5 is 3. You're done. That's your historical premium. You're saying this is good. But when you use a historical premium, you're already making a couple of assumptions, right? The first is... When you use this premium as your future premium, what, what's the first thing you're assuming? The future is going to look like the past. It's called mean reversion. You're saying, what's wrong with that? If you live in a stable economic model, of course there's nothing wrong with it. You know when it gets difficult is when you have structural shifts where something significant is changing. Saying, what are you talking about? Until 2008, I was OK with people using historical risk premiums in markets like the US. Because if you made the assumption or made the argument, the US is a stable economic model. Things always revert back to the way they used to be. That was a pretty good assumption from the end of the Second World War to 2000. That was a pretty solid assumption. You see, what happened in 2008? Go back and look at 2008. The world as we know it shifted. There was a structural shift. We can debate how big the shift was and what it changed. But to assume that things would revert back to the way they used to be struck, strikes me as incredibly dangerous. So that's my first reason for being a little cautious about these historical risk premiums that everybody else uses. Here's my second one. What did I say the historical premium was? It's a difference between what you can make on stocks versus what you can make on something risk-free over a period of time, right? If you ask me what the historical risk premium is in the US, I'm going to give you 12 different numbers. It could be anywhere from 2.73 to 8%. And here's why. It depends on what slice of history I look at. If I go all the way back to 1928, and I update this on my website at the start of every year, so this is a January 2015 update through 2014. If I go back to 1928, I get a very different premium than if I go back 50 years or 10 years. So it depends on the slice of history. It depends on what I call risk-free. If I use short-term governments, which are T-bills as my risk-free, three-month T-bills, I get a different premium than if I use 10-year T-bonds. And it also depends on whether I use arithmetic averages or geometric averages. That might sound like inside baseball or inside statistics. But an arithmetic average, I just add up 80 numbers and divide by 80 if I want an average. A geometric average is a compounded average. Do you see the distinction? Let me give you a very simple example to illustrate how different the numbers can be. Let's say you buy a stock this year for 100. It doubles next year, goes to 200, and halves the year after, goes back to 100. Let's say there are no dividends in the stock. So you bought it today for 100. Two years from now, it's back to 100. How much money do you make on the stock? Trick question, you're saying. You actually made a 25% return? It's the magic of averaging. Do you see how it's 25%? It doubled next year, so your return next year is plus 100%. It halved the, next, the year after, the return is minus 50. 100 minus 50 is 50 divided by 2 is 25%. You 
you just think you made no money, but guess what? You really made a 25% return. That's the arithmetic average. A geometric average return obviously is zero. And already I let you make a judgment as to which is a more realistic reflection of what you actually made, but that's the arithmetic versus geometric averages. Now this is actually very convenient for analysts to have all these different numbers because they can get away using pretty much any number they want now and say it's a historical premium. So I'm going to take away your degrees of freedom. Remember, your objective is to estimate a premium for the future, not a premium for the past. So the first thing I'm going to suggest you do is you go back as far as you can. Go back to 1928 or 1871 or as far back as you can, and here's why. It's stat 101. When you compute an average over a period, you're forced to report in brackets below it the standard error of your estimate. So if I told you the equity risk premium over the last 85 years, sounds impressive already, 85 years, a lot of time, is 4.6%. That sounds impressive until I tell you that the standard error in that number is 2.3%. Try that out and precise. If I tell you that the premium is 4.6 and I tell you the standard error is 2.3%, the true premium could be as low as zero. It could be 9.2. That's with 85 years of history. If I tell you the equity risk premium over the last 10 years is 2.73%, before you get too excited, see the standard error there? It's 8.65%. So if I tell you the risk premium over the last 10 years, I might as well have told you absolutely nothing. So when you see 20, 25, 30 year premiums, which is what you often get in emerging markets, it's noise. There is no number there because the standard error is going to drown out that premium. So go back as far as you can. Be consistent about what you use as your risk free rate. What do we say we're going to use in corporate finance as our risk free rate? The short term or the long term rate? The 10, the 10 year T bond is our risk free rate. So I don't care about T bill premium. So I'm going to go back as far as I can. I am going to go with the T bond rate as my risk free rate. And this premium is going to get compounded over time. And because it gets compounded over time, I'm going to go with the geometric. Average. So if you force me to pick a number, and I'm very uncomfortable even doing that, the number I would pick as my historical risk premium for the U.S., it's a very specific statement, over the last 86 years is 4.6%. Question? Uh, right. Yeah, because geometric averages don't have standard errors, so I've got to steal from the arithmetic average. The arithmetic averages actually have the standard errors, geometric average, because of the way they compound it. So I'm stealing from the arithmetic average estimate to transfer it, because it is, in fact, the measure of the noise in that period of premium. Okay. But you're right. Arithmetic averages are what go with the standard errors, but geometric averages are also colored by the same standard error issue. Okay. So the next time somebody says, I'm using a historical risk premium, before you let them get away with it, ask them where they got it, and they're going to say, I got it from Ibbotson, or I got it from Duff and Phelps. You say, who's Ibbotson, and why are you talking to Duff and Phelps? Because those are basically historical data services that deliver historical premiums. Then ask them what period of history they're using, and they're very proudly going to say 85 years. Oh, that sounds like a lot. Say, are you aware of how much standard error there is in your estimate? They'll say, what's the standard error? You got them nailed. Because this is basically the Achilles heel of historical premiums is these numbers come with huge noise terms, huge standard errors. Okay. Any questions on historical data? Now, if it's tough to get a historical risk premium for the US, you know how much more difficult it is if you ask me what the risk premium in India is or China is? Or, I mean, these are markets with much shorter histories, right? Even though the markets might have been around for a long time, you could go back more than 20 or 25 years in most emerging markets, you probably have 10 companies that used to trade, and the trading was very light. It's a very short historical data. I have a Brazilian company in my sample. I have an Indian company in my sample. I have a Chinese company in my sample. So let's assume that they come to me and say, I'd like an, a cost of equity, a hurdle rate. I have to make decisions. I have two choices. I can ask them to come back in, a, in about 50 or 60 years, and I'll have enough historical data to be able to do this right, or try to do something right now. My suggestion is we want to try to do something right now. So let me take you through the process of trying to estimate an equity risk premium for a market without very much history, which is true for pretty much 
every market out there other than the US. Maybe some European markets you can go back, but even there, the Second World War acted as a break in those markets. You get this five-year break or four-year break in the data. So here's the process I'm going to use, and this is the simplest way in which I can get an equity risk premium for other markets. Let's assume I have an equity risk premium for the US. So November of 2013, the data that I, the table that I just showed you is today's table, but in 2000, November of 2013, if you looked at that table, it would have been through 2012, the risk premium for the US was 4.2%. So let's say you have that and you feel pretty comfortable with it, even though you shouldn't be, let's say you feel pretty comfortable. So you have a risk premium for the US. You want a risk premium for other countries. Let's assume that I have India, China, and Brazil as the countries for which you need a risk premium. You know the risk premium should be higher for those countries than they are for the US, right? So 4.2% is your premium for the US. You need a measure of the additional spread or additional premium you should be charging for those markets because they're riskier. Remember how I came up with a default spread to clean up your risk free rate? And I said, don't worry about this number too much because it's going to come back and revisit you later in this process. Well, here it is back again. That same default spread I took out of the government bond rate to make it risk-free is now becoming my proxy for the additional country risk in each of those countries. You might not remember, but for India, the default spread I took out of the government bond rate was 2.25%. I now add it back into my equity risk premium, saying India is riskier. I'm going to add the extra 2.25%. The default spread I took out for China was 0.8%. Now it goes back in, added on to the 4.2%. I come up with the risk premium for China. And Brazil, the default spread I took out was 2%. Now comes. Now do you see why I took it out of the government bond rate? Because if I did not do that, and, and bankers, this is the default way in which bankers adjust risk premiums. If I now add the spread on and I left it in the government bond rate, I'd be double counting risk in these countries. That's why I went through that fairly, pay, fairly painful process of cleaning up government bond rates, because if I don't do that, you double count risk. So this is the most simplistic way of coming up with country risk premiums, is to have a US premium that you get from the historical data, and add on top of that the default spread, which you can get by either looking at the CDS market, or by looking at the rating for the country and coming up with the default spread based on that rating. Or if you can find a dollar-denominated bond issued by the country, the spread over the USD bond. Any questions? Yes? You'd give it 4.2%. That's actually a very good point, because in this approach, once you get the US premium, you're assuming it's a premium not just for the US, but for any mature market, which you define to be a AAA-rated market. And the rationale is very simple. Once you have 10 markets that you call mature, they kind of have different equity risk premiums because then money will flow out of the lower premium market and the higher premium market. So that's actually the simplest way to, to kind of deal with AAA rated countries. Yes? Absolutely. But you know what the standard error in a default spread is going to be, right? I mean, it's a re I mean, there are no perfect estimates. So if you think about relative standard errors, the standard error in my historical premium was, let's say, 2 point something, 2.3%. The standard error in the default spread is going to be like 0.1%. Okay? So true, every number is a standard error. You've got to make some judgments. Here you're building off. My worry is actually not that the default spread is going to be wrong, but that the 4.2% is wrong. That's where my big worry is, because that were really 7%, then all of this is noise I'm adding on top. So my bigger concern still remains a base number, and we'll come back and, and, we, and we'll deal with that, because I think that should be potentially something that we have to do better. So this is the simplest way. But when I do this, what am I assuming about default spreads? That they measure not just what you charge for buying a bond issued by that country, but you also charge this for investing in equities in that country, right? Let me ask you an intuitive question. Take those default spreads. Let's assume they're reasonable proxies for what you would charge for buying an Indian, Chinese, and a Brazilian government bond. So you're charging 2.25% for buying an Indian government bond, right? Now I ask you to invest in Indian equities. Would you expect equities to be riskier than that government bond or safer than that government bond? Because I remember the first time I saw this approach, I said, this doesn't make sense to me. It looks like you're underestimating risk because this is a spread for buying a bond with a fixed coupon, but I'm investing in stocks. So my logic would lead me to believe that the premium I would charge for India, China, and Brazil should be larger than these numbers. 
which leaves me in no man's land because I have to estimate how much larger. So here's what I do, and this is my twist on what bankers do to get risk premiums. I look up two additional numbers. One is the standard deviation in the equity index in that country, and the second is the standard deviation in the country in the government bond. So let me put some numbers because it's abstract. Take India. India, the default spread is 2.25 percent. The standard deviation in the Sensex, which is the, in the Indian equity index, is 24 percent. The standard deviation in the Indian government bond is 17 percent. Let's do an algebra problem. If I bought the bond with a standard deviation of 17 percent, I'm charging a 2.25 percent spread. But I'm buying equities, which are riskier. The standard deviation is 24 percent. All I'm doing is scaling up the default spread to reflect the fact that equities in a market are generally riskier than bonds. It's just one additional step, but rather than use the default spread, I'm scaling it up. Will it always be scaled up? A few weeks ago, I got an email from somebody in Venezuela, and they were trying to use my approach to come up with an equity risk premium in Venezuela. In Venezuela, the equity index actually has a lower standard deviation than the Venezuelan government bond. I don't know what that tells you about the riskiness of the Venezuelan government and what it's doing to the economy. He was getting a standard deviation of equity that's, that was 0.64 times the standard deviation of the government bond. He said, what did I do wrong? And I said, maybe you didn't. Maybe in Venezuela, it's better to buy equity in a business and invest in the government bond. And that's not such a far reach. You can come up with reasons as to why that might be. But in most cases, equities are going to be riskier, so you're going to be using a larger spread. So my end equity risk premiums, and you're going to see this play out for the rest of this class. In November of 2013, my equity risk premium for India was 7.8%, so that's the, in, that's the US premium plus that. The Brazilian equity risk premium is 7.2%. And the Chinese equity risk premium in 5.6%. That's all based on a US premium being 4.2%, and I'm still not comfortable with that. So I'll come back and deal with that, but I'm building off the US premium to come up with the risk premiums by country. Now let me deal with that 4.2%. 4.2% was a historical premium. I was looking backwards, right? It's static, it's got this big standard error. I'd much rather have a forward-looking premium that's dynamic, that has a smaller standard error. And I think there's a way I can get there. This actually I, I kind of wrestled with for a while, but here's what gave me the opening for computing this premium. Do you know how to compute the yield to maturity on a bond? Come on, it's foundations. You should have done that somewhere, right? Somebody help me out. What is the process by which I es estimate the yield to maturity on a bond? You want to try? What do I do? I'll help you along if you get stuck. You take the present value. First, you take the price of the bond, and then you take the coupons and the face value, and you take the present value. And what do you try to do? You try to extrapolate what the yield was in the future using the interest rate and period. It, for the yield to maturity, though, your end game is a different one, which is you try different discount rates until the present value of the coupons and the face value is equal to the price of the bond. Right? That's the, it's like an internal rate. It's a glorified IRR. Right, you give me the bond price, you give me the coupons and the face value. The yield to maturity is that discount rate that makes the present value of my cash flows equal to the price of the bond. Now let me steal from that concept and try this in equities. Let's say that you decide to buy the entire S&P 500. Can you do that? Yeah, you can buy an index fund or you can buy spiders. So you buy the entire index. You know, do you know what it will cost you right now, right? Basically it will be whatever the index is trading at. So you bought, instead of bond, you bought the 500 largest market cap stocks in the US. You're not going to get any coupons, right? So instead of coupons, what form will your cash flows take if you bought stocks? Dividends, and in the US, increasingly buybacks. And unlike a coupon, which is fixed up front, I have no idea what those cash flows will be in the future. But I can tell you what they were in the last one. So let me put you back on November 1st of 2013, which is when I was doing this process, where I had that historical premium of 4.2%, and see if I can go through the process. On November 1st of 2013, the S&P 500 was at 1756.54. So that's what you bought. The cash flows in the 12 months leading up to November 1st, which is all I know. Last year's cash flows were 82.35. Notice where it's coming from. U.S. companies, and this is something we'll come back and talk about a lot more, return more cash now in the form of buybacks than pay out traditional dividends. In other markets, this might be different, more dividends and buybacks. But in the U.S., 
In the 12 months leading up to November 1st of 2013, your cash flow would have been 82.35. So that was your cash flow last year. But I want cash flows next year, two years out, three years out. So I cheat. I said, what, I know what the cash flow was last year. If I could just get a growth rate in these cash flows that markets are expecting, then I can predict future cash flows. The S&P 500 is the most tracked and followed index in the world by far. And there are actually analysts whose job it is to forecast earnings for the entire index. These are not, they don't follow individual companies, they just follow the index. There are about a dozen of them, mostly in New York, and they come out with their estimates of what the growth will be in the earnings for the index. And at November 1st of 2013, that number was 5.59%. I'm almost home. I have the cash flow from last year. I have an expected growth rate, for better or worse. I apply that growth rate, 5.59% at 82.35, I get the expected cash flows for the next five years. And then I run into a second problem. A bond has a fixed maturity, right? And a face value at the end. Stocks could go on forever. And these are the 500 largest market cap stocks. There are not any 500 stocks. So at some point in time, the growth in earnings at these companies has to converge on the growth rate of the economy. Do you see why? Because their earnings keep growing at 7%. The economy is growing at 2% things are going to start blowing up. So the end of five years, I tried to bring the growth rate down to the growth rate of the economy. And now I'm facing a measurement issue. It's tough enough forecasting economic growth next year and two years out. I'm trying to forecast it beyond year five forever. So I'm going to use a cheat that I'm going to come back to over and over again. When in doubt, try this out because it really works. That actually rhymes. I didn't mean, to, mean for it to rhyme. Okay. You know the risk-free rate in your valuation? We think of it as what you demand for a risk-free investment. That risk-free rate is actually a great proxy, a great measure of the nominal growth rate in the economy. I'll send you a graph after class today, which kind of brings us home because I have the T-bond rate for the last 60 years and expected inflation and real growth in the economy every year. And you look at the two graphs. It's uncanny. The numbers fall on each other. So what I'm also trying to say is if you think about why risk-free rates have been low for the last five years, it's not QE1 or QE2 or QE3 or the Titanic or whatever you've been told. The risk-free rate has been low because expected inflation has been low and expected real growth has been low. Okay. So at the end of five years, here's what I do. I set the growth rate equal to my risk-free rate, which is 2.55% there. So let's compare the two problems. Instead of buying a bond, you bought the S&P 500 for 1756.54. Instead of getting coupons, you get these expected cash flows in perpetuity. And what is the yield to maturity? It's what discount rate makes the present value of my cash flows equal to what I paid up front. So there it is. It's a little messier than a bond problem, right? Because it's got all these inf you know, cash flows going on forever. But if you've ever used a solver function in Excel, it's a godsend when you have something like this because it tries out different discount rates. Hey, I found one. And in November 2013, it came back with 8.04%. You're saying, what does that even mean? In November, if you bought US stocks, I don't care what you hoped you would make, what you prayed you would make, what you thought you would make, given what you paid for stocks, you can expect to make 8.04% a year in the long term. The risk-free rate was 2.55%. The difference between those two numbers would have given me an equity risk premium in November of 2013 of roughly 5.5%. Now let's step back. I'm doing this because I don't like historical premiums, right? Why do I not like historical premiums? Because there's a big standard error in those estimates. You think, couldn't you be wrong about these? Absolutely. My growth rates could be long, wrong. My cash flow could be wrong. But guess what? The standard error in those estimates is about 0.15 to 0.2%. Which means that this 5.5% could be 5.1, it could be 5.9, but it's not going to be 2.3 or 7.8. So this is called an implied equity risk premium because I'm backing it out of the level of the index. It comes with a plus, which you might think of as a minus, which is it is dynamic. What I mean by dynamic is on November 2nd, when I compute my implied equity risk premium, it's going to be different. November 3rd, it's going to be different. November, you're saying, that's a pain. I just want a number that stays the same. Hey, this is reality. The world shifts. This is the price of risk. It's a constantly changing number. 
Now, just to give you some perspective on where this number is, I'll show you what the premiums look like over time. But before I do this, I'm going to make a choice. Because all my numbers are going to build off my US equity risk premium, I have to decide what I'm going to use as my base number. Am I going to go with the historical data, which gives me 4.2%, or am I going to go with this implied premium, which is 5.5%? And it was a choice that was very easy for me. Since 2008, when I come to this fork in the road, I can't even visualize going down that historical premium choice, because not only does it come with this noise term, but it assumes we revert back to the way things used to be, and they're never going to do that. So given the choice, I went with the 5.5 as my base premium. And for every country, then, I'm going to use that additional premium approach still. So, I, um, so the only thing that's changed is I'm still going to do what I did for India, Brazil, and China, but I'm going to do it off a base of 5.5% rather than 4.2%, because I want that base to be more solid. Any questions about the implied premium approach? It's a messy concept, but try to wrap your head around it, because if you do, you crack the code on equities collectively. It sounds like a strong statement to make, but if you really understand implied premiums, you can take apart Robert Schiller in a direct debate. I'm not kidding. When he talks about the PE, the, you know, the Schiller PE being 23 and stocks being overvalued, you, you can ask him two questions that kind of disentangle exactly where, what he's missing. And you're saying, I can't tell a Nobel Prize winner he's missing something. Even Nobel Prize winners do shoddy things sometimes. And this will allow you to kind of see what's being missed when you kind of focus in on a PE or a Schiller PE or some other number that looks alluring at first sight, but it's really not that deep. Okay? So let me use this now to get my risk premiums for my other countries. So here's what I'm going to do. First step, I need a premium for the US. So I come up with the 5.5% as my implied premium. Step two, for any AAA rated country, I'm going to give it the 5.5% premium. If you're not AAA rated, then I'm going to add an additional premium. And it's going to be a function of what your default spread is and how much risk your equities are than bonds in that country. So every, every year, I actually create this picture. And I'll give you the January 2015 picture. But in November 2013, this is what the world looked like in terms of equity risk premiums to me. So let me take it apart. First, notice that a lot of 5.5%, that's my mature market premium that I got by looking at the S&P 500 being applied to every AAA rated country. Canada, Australia, Germany, Sweden, they all have 5.5%. If you are not AAA rated, then I, I have more work to do. I come up with the default spread, I scale it up. So you take Latin America. This is what Latin America looked like to me in November of 2013. The safest country to invest in Latin America was Chile. Well, my country risk premium is 1.2%, added on to the 5.5%, that gives me 67 I won't even go to the riskiest countries, but you can see where they are, and there are no surprises, right? It's Ecuador, Honduras, you know, Argentina. You know, Venezuela actually looks better because the oil bailed them out in November of 2013. So those are my, but you can already see Latin America is treated as a region, but it's very diverse in terms of equity risk premiums. It's something I try to emphasize to companies because they often think of entire regions kind of melting down. But c regions are getting very diverse in terms of risk premiums. You take Asia, you see the spread across countries again. Uh, Singapore is AAA rated. Its equity risk premium is very much like the equity risk premium for the US and Canada. At the other extreme, you have countries like you have Vietnam, you've got Papua New Guinea, you're planning to invest there. So basically, you can see the other, other ends of the spectrum. And Europe used to be this nice safe haven where everything was around 5 to 6. You can already see Europe is starting to kind of break up as well. You've got southern Europe, especially Portugal and Spain and Italy, where the risk premiums are going up. And you've got northern Europe where the premiums are staying at 5.5 mature market levels. You're saying, but why are we doing all of this? We have only India, China, and Brazil. You know why I need this? Disney is a US company, right? Does it get all of its revenues in the US? So here's my reason for doing this. Your equity risk premium as a company has nothing to do with where you're incorporated. It's got everything to do with where you do business. I need this entire table because I have multinationals in my sample. And in fact, if you ask me what the equity risk premium for Disney is, 
I can do the lazy thing and say it's a US company, I'll use the US risk premium, which is 5.5%. But that would not be right because their revenues are spread out as follows. They get 82% from the US and Canada, 11.6% from Europe, 6% from Asia, the Asia Pacific, 0.33%. I was actually surprised how little they got from Latin America. The equity risk premium I'm going to use is going to be a weighted average of the equity risk premiums of the different parts of the world that they operate in. So if you think you're going to be working in New York and London and therefore you don't have to worry about emerging market risk, think again. Because emerging market risk will show up in almost every company you assess because the nature of the game is you've got companies getting their revenues from different parts of the world and your equity risk premium has to reflect that. Why do I use revenue weights though? What are the choices? I could use revenue weights. I could use where your production is, right? Where your factory is built. I could use a combination of the two. I'll tell you why I use revenue weights, because I got desperate. I got desperate because I went through the 10Ks looking for information on, where do you produce stuff? I found nothing. Revenues are the one item I get consistently, and they're the one item that cannot turn negative. That's why I don't use EBITDA weights or EBIT weights, because that's asking for trouble. First, accountants do all kinds of strange things, and those numbers can be negative. So it's simplistic, but it's very effective in coming, coming up with equity risk premiums for each company. So that's Disney. I decided to do the for the remaining companies. There were two easy ones, Bookscape and Baidu. I was home free, because Bookscape is a New York bookstore. It gets all of its revenues in New York. I could use a US equity risk premium. Baidu, because nobody outside China uses it as a search engine. Good news, so I could use the Chinese equity risk premium. But we think of Vale as a Brazilian company, right? Take a look at where it gets its revenues. Vale is a Chinese company, just doesn't know it yet. 37% of its revenues come from China. Because that's where the iron ore, I mean, they're building ghost cities out of ghost cities on top of other ghost cities, and you need a lot of iron ore to build more ghost cities, so it's 37%. Tata Motors. Looks like an Indian company based on its incorporation. But take a look at its breakdown. In fact, I updated these numbers. And guess what? Tata Motors is also a Chinese company. Maybe we're all Chinese companies, and we don't know it yet. But essentially what I'm doing is breaking down revenues by country or region and taking a weighted average. Incidentally, one thing I forgot to mention here. See these regional averages I report? Those are GDP-weighted regional averages. And the reason I do GDP-weighted averages is if you take Asia and you take China and Vietnam, I can't weight them equally because one is a huge economy and the other is small. So I use the GDP of each country to weight it. Same thing with Latin America. Brazil has a disproportionate effect on the equity risk premium for Latin America because it's so much bigger than everybody else. So the reason I do those regional averages is companies like Disney actually report only by region. Companies like Coca-Cola report only by region. And some of you might have these US companies that do what I think is almost unforgivable, which is they'll report revenues in the US. And then what do they do? 74% of our revenues come from the US, 26% from the rest of the world. Come on, guys. That's a really big place. Can you be a little more specific? And it's, it's a problem because I can't do valuation of these companies. The 26% is all in Greece. I'm in big trouble. I can't just assume it's spread out around the world. I think while accountants go into all these little details about information disclosure, this is something we have to start requiring all companies to be much more specific about. Is where exactly do you sell your stuff? And where do you produce this stuff? Because those are fundamental requirements I need as an investor looking at the company. And if you're within the company, you better be looking at where you're investing and where you're selling, because that's what's driving the risk of your company. Okay. Now, until 2008, I used to compute the equity risk premium for the US once every year, the start of every year, and use it for the rest of the year. That was my mature market premium for the whole year. And my defense was, it is a developed market. What can happen? over the course of the year, because that used to be what divided developed from emerging markets, is risk premiums don't change dramatically in developed markets. That's in emerging markets that they jump around. 
And I lived in that nice, safe, I call these the days of innocence. When developed markets were developed markets, and emerging markets were emerging markets, and never the twain shall meet. So September 1st of 2008, you'd come to me and say, what's the equity risk premium in the US? My answer is it would be, it's about 4.4%, and that part would have been true. And then I'd have probably said something else which would have got me into trouble. And it's not going to change too much because it's a developed market. That's September 1st of 2008. This is actually a graph of equity risk premiums. Remember that implied premium? I computed it every day. This was my torture. Every morning when I was coming into work, I'd compute the equity risk premium that day, the S&P 500. So it's a day-by-day -day computation, starting September 12th of 2008. Nobody remembers September 12th of 2008. It was a Friday. I was on my way home at 4 o'clock. Why was I going home at 4 o'clock? I know, it's, I, I keep academic hours, which means I come in when I want, I leave when I want. <laughs> so basically, I was going home because I just wanted to go home. And I was listening to the news. And in the news, there was a story about Lehman being in trouble and Barclays being interested in buying Lehman. I have to make a confession. I didn't even think twice about it. I said, what if it doesn't happen? On Monday, you're going to wake up. Lehman stock is going to go down. Lehman employees, obviously. Will. But this was not a market-wide. Remember, we talked about firm specific. September 15th, you wake up, of course, to the crisis. This is day by day. See this green line? That's actually my implied equity risk premium for the US on a daily basis. So it starts at about 4.4%. Let's look at this axis. There was a day in November when the implied equity risk premium in the US hit 8%. In the course of two months, the equity risk premium in the US almost doubled. The red line is the S&P 500 collapsing. As stock prices collapse, implied premiums go up. And if you don't get the intuition, think bond prices and interest rates, right? Because when bond prices collapse, what happens to interest rates? They go up. Same phenomenon. Stock prices collapse. Equity risk premiums shoot through the roof. By the end of the year, it was at 6.43%. And you know the lesson I got out of this? Never again would I compute an equity risk premium at the start of every year and stick with it through the course of a year because lots can happen in a year. So starting in September of 2008, I've been computing my equity risk premium for the US, for the S&P 500, every month. I'll send you the Excel spreadsheet that I use. It's very transparent. You can change the numbers you don't like and do it yourself. I give you choices as to how to compute it. But I do it at the start of every month. And there are three ways you can get it. One is the long way. You can download the spreadsheet and do it yourself, which, you, which, which I, th I would suggest because you can claim ownership and you understand what's going on. If you're too lazy to do that, you go to the front page of my website. It's right there. Equity risk premium as of February 1st, 2015. If you're too lazy to even do that, I have a third choice, and you have to thank my daughter for this. It's about three or four years ago. I was at home minding my own business, which is what I usually do. I would say in my office, but it's really a little corner of a little corner of a little corner of a little room. And she busts into the room. She never walks in. She never waltzes in. She's one of four, and her, she has brothers. She behaves like a boy most of the time. She comes in and says, Dad, do you have a Twitter account? I said, no, Kendra, I don't. She said, Dad, you're so old. But she gets walks out. Why you'd come and state the obvious and walk out, I don't know. <laughs> right? But after she walks out of the room, I'm pissed off. She says, how difficult can it be to have a Twitter account? So I go on Twitter, I create an account, and I forget all about it. Six months later, she busts into my room again. See, it's a habit. He says, Dad, do you know you have a 1,000 followers on Twitter? And I said, what the heck are they following? <laughs> I've never Twitter tweeted nothing. I go on, sure enough, there are 1,000 people following somebody who never tweets. So I said, if they're following me, I have to give them something to follow. At the start of every month, guess what I tweet out? The equity risk premium for the S&P 500 just hit 6.01%. Fascinating tweet. It just flies all over. It goes viral. <laughs> hey? But that day was the day I woke up to what I think will be the ultimate revenge on my kids. I will always have more Facebook followers than they do. <laughs> I will have more LinkedIn contacts than they do. And I will definitely have more Twitter followers than they do. I'm almost at 40,000. I'm at 39.5 thousand 
you guys can help me out here. So here's what I want you to do. If you, if you don't have a Twitter account, create one. It's a useless piece of thing that, that's floating around there. But you're on all these social media, which are all useless anyway. Right? If you have five email addresses, add them all on. You count as a follower. If your dog has an email address, put it in as well. Follow me and then block me. I don't care if you ever read another tweet. I just want numbers. I want to get to 40,000 first. That's my first target. Then I want to beat Kanye West. Because this guy should have no followers. Because you look at his Twitter, tw first, half his tweets are blanked out. Because they're, you know, the, the words, I guess, can't be spread around the world. So basically, it's the, the uh, And he has 11.2 million. Life is not fair. <laughs> In fact, what really struck me was about um, three, two years ago, I get to 16,000. I'm really proud of myself. And then the snake escapes from the Bronx Zoo. You might have heard about this. Somebody creates a Twitter account for the snake. And in two weeks, the snake had 20,000 followers. And I said, what is this? Yeah. But you already know what the end game here is. I, I've said this many times. I want to be the Lady Gaga of finance, which is, that woman is amazing. She has like 42 million followers. I won't get there, but Lady Gaga of finance, 42,000 might do it. So push, me, push my numbers up. I mean, whatever, whatever you can do, tell your friends to, you know, what, whatever needs to be done. And as a bonus, they will get the equity risk premium for the S&P 500. <laughs> So let me get you updated. This is actually the email I sent this morning. For some reason, I don't know how this happened. In your package, it's frozen in January 2014. Don't worry about it. You got the email. You left the January 2015. So this is the January 2015. So remember, it was 5.5%, right? But you're doing a project in 2015, not in November of 2013. The world has shifted a little bit. So this is my equity risk premium at the start of 2015. The index is now at 2059. The cash flows, remember they were 82.74? They're now up to 114.74. The growth rate is very close to what it was three years ago. My expected return based upon those numbers. So I'm doing exactly the same thing. is about 7.95%. Not that different from the 8.04% before, right? But you see what else has changed? My T-bond rate, which is 2.55%, has now dropped to 2.17%, the difference gives me an equity risk premium of 5 That's at the start of February. I'll get it even more updated. February, of, I'm sorry, that's the start of January. February of 2015, the equity risk premium hit 6%. Two reasons. One is the cash flows went up a little bit. You know what the bigger reason was? What happened to the T-bond rate between January and February? It actually dropped below 2%. So my equity risk premium in the U.S. is not. You say, what does this even mean? In my valuation class, when I'm valuing companies with U.S. operations, that is my equity risk premium for this month. It's about 6%. What will it be next month? I don't know yet. That's what makes it exciting. March 1st, I'll redo the whole thing. Maybe it'll be higher than 6, lower than 6. But it's a moving target. Get used to it. Just like the risk-free rate will change over the five months that you're doing this class, the equity risk premium will as well. Okay? So that number will change, and with it, everything else, your herded rates, your value, your capital structure, your dividend policy, everything else will be shifting with it as well. So to give you a sense of perspective as to where this number stands in the larger scheme of things, I have a graph where I've implied equity risk premiums going back to 1960. I'd love to tell you that I've been doing this every year since 1960, but I have to be a very precocious baby to have been able to do that. So these are premiums where I put myself back on January 1st, 1960, uh, 1960, 1961, 1962, et cetera, and computed the implied premium every year. This gives you the history of US equities for the last 55 years. And here's what. See the 1960s? Incredibly stable period for US equities. Implied premium between 3 and 3.5%. Three and then you get to the 1970s. What do you notice? The premium is shooting through the roof. And what I said. If the premium is shooting up, what's happening to stock prices? They're collapsing in the 1970s. What happened in the 1970s that made equity risk premiums shoot up? In oil prices were the precipitating factor, but it's the inflation that came out of it that was so deadly. Inflation is deadly for equities. Latin Americans know this, but people in developed markets sometimes forget this. Listen to, I read these Paul Krugman columns, where he says, why don't we let inflation go to 3%? What's a big deal? Inflation is like the genie 
in the bottle. You let it out of the bottle, it won't stop at three. It could be 13 before you know it. To me, the risk is not worth it because we've seen what happens to financial assets when inflation kind of gets out of that bottle. I'd much rather settle low and be wrong than settle high and be wrong. The consequences are devastating across the board. So 1970s, the equity risk premiums. It hit 6.5% in 1978, and Business Week runs a cover, and you can find this online. It says, stocks are dead. Don't invest in stocks ever again, which actually is a good rule to follow. When the popular press says, this is it, this is the end, it's like a Seth Rogen movie. This is definitely not the end. This is perhaps the best time to jump in. In 1978, if you jumped into equities, you had one of the great bull markets of all time. In fact, you look at that line. Going. End of 1999, the implied equity risk premium in the US hit 2%. You know why that should scare you? When I did that little survey in this room, how many people put up their hands when I offered zero to two? Not one. So if you were true to your word at the end of 99, what would you have been, should you have been doing in the stock market? You should all have been out of the stock market and it, it didn't happen that way because we're, we're, capa we're capable of deluding ourselves into believing this is new, the new paradigm shifts, whatever it is. But the end of 99 to 2%. So the end of 99, if I told you there's a bubble in the equity market, you see my basis for saying that? So you're settling for 2%, that's too low. Historically, it's been 3, 4, 5%, 2% is way too low. So in early 2000, if I wrote an article saying there's a bubble, so I could be the shiller of 2000, there's a bubble, I'd have had a basis for saying that because the equity risk premium hit a historical low. What did I say the historical, the equity risk premium is right now? It's about 6%. Look at that graph. 6% is not low, it's actually at the high end of the spectrum. So if you're going to tell me stocks are in a bubble, you better come up with something much more then, hey, stocks have gone up a lot, therefore they're in a bubble. Because in this market, given rates and growth, growth rates and cash flows, stocks are not the problem. You can have, you can have a problem with the T-bond rate being too low, but stocks are delivering pretty much what they should be delivering on an expected return basis. So it's actually my way of kind of, whenever I read an article about a bubble, like, like everyone else, you, you get a little scared. So Nobel Prize winner thinks there's a bubble. Nouriel Roubini thinks there's a bubble. Nouriel's been thinking there's a bubble for 18 years, so that's kind of a, at some point in time, there will be a bubble that bursts, and I told you so. Eh? So it's, eh? so it's, it's the, the people when they throw this word bubble out are casual about it. If you're gonna talk about bubbles, let's be a little more rigorous about why you think there's a bubble, other than hey, stocks have gone up a lot, therefore there must be a bubble. I'm supposed to be on CNBC half time, I guess the midday show that later, because they're expecting the NASDAQ to hit 5,000. I know exactly what they want me to come in and say, which is, there's a bubble, sell and move. I'm gonna come and say, buy, buy, buy. It's gonna freak them out. <laughs> <laughs> it's gonna freak, but my, my point is, we, no, we can't just make judgments about bubbles and bubbles bursting by just looking at what's happened. We have to look at why it happened. You know why? There's no bubble because while stock prices have gone up dramatically since 2009, cash flows on U.S. stocks have gone up even more dramatically. They've increased 280% since the bottom of this crisis. That's what cash flows have gone up by. So actually stocks look cheaper now than they did in 2009 if you adjust for those cash flows. That's what the equity risk premium is showing you. And that's the advantage of doing this implied premium is at least you can get a sense of what's driving this. So I promised you the updated page. So this is what the page looked like this year. So this is basically the only thing that's changed, of course, is my base premium is now 5 point, remember 5.78, I've kind of rounded it down to 5.75. And of course, all the ratings have been up, updated to reflect the new ratings. This is the most downloaded data set by far on my website, by far. And it gets used in the strangest places. And almost every month I get at least an email from somebody using the equity risk premium asking me something over the top. So here are a couple of examples. I get an email from the New Zealand Milk Board. I didn't even know there was a New Zealand Milk Board until I get this email. 
saying we're using your country risk premiums to set prices for New Zealand farmers. <laughs> Who are you selling the milk to? I don't know. No. Or maybe they're selling them to Zimbabwe, and they couldn't find the country risk. But usually it is, how do you come up with the risk premiums? And I have a little PDF file that I've created with a little YouTube on, this is what I do. And don't watch it because it's the same thing I've told you, so unless you want to watch the same thing over and over again. But there are some emails to which I don't have a response. Like this year I get one from somebody in South Africa. I say, what have you done to Zimbabwe? What? He said, what do you mean, what have I done to Zimbabwe? Said, oh, it's not there anymore. I said, well, Moody's doesn't rate them anymore. What do you want me to do? So you got to bring Zimbabwe back. I said, OK, I'll let me talk to Mugabe, and we can, we can, we can come to an arrangement. Right? Or my, my least favorite email of all time was in March of 2009. I get this email. If you're from the Middle East, and you take this badly. Sorry. Okay? I get this email from Lebanon. I'm pretty excited. I didn't get that many emails in the Middle East on valuation. I open up the email, and here's how it begins. You have destroyed Lebanon. <laughs> destroyed Lebanon after 25 years of civil war in Hezbollah. I'm the guy. So I keep reading. What the heck did I do? So this is from a Lebanese business person whose business had been appraised for value. And the appraiser had used the equity risk premium from my page to value his business. See, there's Lebanon right now. It's 14%. That was like 15% in, in March or April of 2000. You can see why this guy was pissed off. You put in a 15% equity risk premium. What's happening to your discount rate? It's going through the roof. Your discount rate goes up. Your value goes He felt he'd been gypped. And it was all my fault. My first reaction is, this has nothing to do with me. Take it up with your appraiser. But then I did remember the email was from Lebanon. And I should be a little more careful about how I responded. So I looked for somebody else to blame. And I found someone. How do I get these risk premiums again? I start with the Moody's rating for your country, right? So if you have a bad rating, you're in the toilet. I can't even rescue you. You're gone. So I said, it's not my fault. It's Moody's fault. <laughs> and by the way, if you want an address to put in your GPS, here's Moody's address. <laughs> okay? It's not 44 West 4th Street, so don't come parking anything right in front of this building. <laughs> Nothing untoward has happened yet. So, you know, so what I'm trying to say is there is zero intellectual firepower behind these numbers. I'm not saying this. Uh, I like Brazil, so let me lower the premium. I hate Chile, I'll raise the premium. And I didn't like that drink I had in Venezuela, I'll raise that premium. So it's, it's, got not, it's, 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 it's transparent and it's simplistic. It's based on the rating. So if the rating is bad, your risk premium can be bad. In fact, the spreadsheet that contains this, I also use the CDS spreads as an alternative measure. If you don't like the rating, you don't trust Moody's, the only problem with CDS spreads is they're available for only 67 countries. Ratings are available for 140. Are there any missing countries, though, that you see there? There is, of course, the entire Caribbean. Actually, the, I've knocked the Caribbean off. It's all these tiny little countries. So you can actually get the Dominican Republic. You can get Jamaica. But in a sense, how much business can you really do there, right? Take a look at the Middle East. Some missing pieces, right? There's no Iran. There's no Iraq. There's no Afghanistan in Asia. These are called frontier markets. So you ask me, what equity risk premium should I demand if I'm investing in Afghanistan? My answer is a big premium. <laughs> but that's really not helpful enough. So I actually have devised this kind of simplistic way of coming up with risk premiums for these frontier markets, because some companies have to invest in that. Unfortunately, there are natural resources that you might have to get out of these countries and you invest in those. So here's what I use as my final cheat, and we'll end up on this. There's actually this service in Europe called Political Risk Services, it's PRS. They actually give a numerical score to a country, including countries like Afghanistan, Iran, Iraq. So because I can't get a rating or a CDS spread for these countries, here's what I do. I go to that PRS score. I find a score for Iraq. Guess what I do next? I find the score for a country for which I have a rating that is similar to Iraq. Let's say it's Cuba. And I give Iraq the same equity risk premium as Cuba. You think that's stretching? I agree. If you have a better way of doing it, I'll jump on board. Right? But this covers pretty much most of the world, and you can get the rest if you have to. But get familiar with this, because if you're part of a global enterprise, which is what we all are, you need risk premiums by country.
decide uh, the ratio of um, equity of uh, what is it? In the formula for uh, this one here. Why would you apply this ratio to as the opposed to what? CDS as opposed to the well, it's basically the ratio tells you how much risk you have. Equity is one. That's all it is. The ratio is just capturing the relative risk of equity to the government bond. The default spread goes to the government bond. It's like an algebra problem. You know the default spread for the government bond. Right. Equities are riskier than government bonds. Yeah. This is my proxy for how much risk you have. So why are you applying it to the credit default? Or well, because the, the default spread goes with the denominator in the equation, right? Oh, okay. So Which basically, it's, All right. so basically okay. it's on the bond. So I'm just scaling it up, it's like the equity. Yes. Uh, do you have a last question? Uh, so how long do you think the U.S. can survive? Um, because the global economy is crashing. China with the shadow banking and those times. I don't know macro stuff. So in a sense, I don't know. It's not. It's really you, that you got to keep your focus small. Let somebody else worry about it. Because the reality is after all the worry, five years later you look back and say, for every 10 crises you worry about, maybe one will come through. You demand a risk premium for that and you move on. Because you worry with economists on every crisis, you can never function. You're going to be paralyzed. So you said uh, just investing in the S&P 500, Vanguard Index will just get you out remove the diversified risk, but then where do you invest now in different asset classes and different regions of the world? In fact, your portfolio should look very much like a portfolio of global, pre-group pie chart of where the world's market value is invested by country and by asset class, and you draw a pie chart for your own portfolio, you should get pretty close. And the further away you are, the less diversified you are. So 30% of the world is in Europe, and you have only 3% of your portfolio in Europe, because somebody, then you are making a market timing judgment. And you got to either have great faith that you can time these markets, or just go out and get 30% of your money into European stocks. Mm -hmm. Hi. Sorry, yeah. so, um, I just want to email about this new trip in the finance. Yeah, I think, think you yeah. you when do you leave? Uh, so, well, it's Friday to Sunday, so, I, so I think check-in yep, is at the floor is in the hotel, and we can always take a later flight, I just didn't know if the LEA where, where is it? It's in Puerto Rico. Okay, when do you think there's going to be an early time on either Wednesday or Thursday? Oh, there is. Okay, great. So I can let the MBA choose in yeah. this class know just that they will have that option. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much. I was checking on whether I could do That's it. That's what I figured. Out. Thank I, you. I found a room, so we're all set. That's awesome. Thanks so much. Is one of those days better? Are there six to one day? Thursday or Wednesday? Is one better for you? Yeah. I'm sure people on Monday Let me work right, on the room. <laughs> Maybe Thursday would be better. Perfect. Thank you.